greatest glory in living lies not in never falling, but in rising every time we fall. Honorable Chief Guest of the Day, Dr. Sharad Shashidharan, respected dignitaries, guests, delegates, and all the participants. A very good evening to one and all present here. I, Pagasri, feel privileged to welcome you all to the 45th talk of Indus Society weekly webinar series, jointly organized by IEEE Kerala Section, Institution of Engineers, India, Kerala State Center, Computer Society of India, Trivandrum Chapter, PMI, Kerala Chapter, Internet Society, Trivandrum Chapter, Welcome Malawi Foundation Trust, Trivandrum, and IEEE EMBS, Kerala Chapter. Lots of factors help business grow, but one of the most important is digital marketing. The role of digital marketing is absolutely essential for business growth in today's day and age. There are many different marketing venues that you can use in order to target your audience and gain the interaction you're looking for. Emotional marketing is one among them. Hence, to share with us the knowledgeable words on the topic, blue is for boys, pink is for girls, leveraging color and emotion in digital marketing, we have a eminent speaker of the day, Dr. Sharad Shashidharan, Associate Professor in Accounting and Information Systems, Schmidthurst College of Business, Bowling Green State University. It's time we begin the event. I invite Adina Nixon from IEEE for the welcome speech. Ma'am, please. Thank you, Ms. Bhagishri. Yes. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Adina Nixon, and it is my pleasure to welcome everyone to the 45th Indus Society weekly webinar series. So today, let's discuss on a very interesting topic. Blue is for boys and pink is for girls. Leveraging color and emotion in digital marketing. To discuss on the topic, on behalf of all those present here, with great honor, I welcome Professor Sharad Shashidharan, PhD, to our 45th talk. Dr. Sharad is an associate professor in accounting and information systems at Smithhurst College of Business, Bowling Green State University. Welcome, sir. It is also my privilege to welcome all dignitaries and distinguished personalities present here, and also our moderator, Ms. Balbisi, along with Zoom Master, Ms. Nesma. Welcome all. I also invite all the attendees present here today. I hope you enjoy this session. And now I hand over to Ms. Agila Gauri Shankar to introduce the speaker. Ma'am, please. Um, Athena, it's, um, Ath uh, Athena, I will take over from here. Thank you, Athena. Uh, now let me invite Dr. Bethany Nies, uh, professor at University of North Georgia to introduce our speaker. Ma'am, please. Great, thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, um, welcome to this exciting session. Uh, my name is Bethany Nice. I am a professor of information systems at the University of North Georgia. Me, I had um, the pleasure of meeting Dr. Sherith Sasidaran at uh, Bowling Green State University in 2017. Uh, so before he joined us in 2017, he earned his undergraduate degree in engineering at the University of Kerala in India his master's of business administration at the University of Glasgow and his PhD at the University of here in the US. He joined Marshall University in 2006 and then joined Emporia State University in 2009. And he's currently settled at Bowling Green State University um, in Ohio <laughs> for his exceptional work in research, service and teaching. And he's won awards in each of those areas. Yeah, created value for academics and professionals alike. Um, he's researched in the areas of decision theory, human and computer interactions, and change management. He's published in new prestigious journals and conferences, and also lends his experience to others as he reviews their works so that they can also uh, contribution to academics and professionals. In addition to Research success, Sherith also dedicates his talent and skills to his students who fondly know him as Dr. S. Uh, he teaches various modalities, uh, which is face-to-face, -face, hybrid, fully online. He teaches undergrad and graduate students, which, which shows his, his um, great range. And he also teaches in a variety of topics, including database design, system implementation, programming, web development, project management, e-commerce, knowledge management, and healthcare informatics. He's well known for connecting students and businesses together so students can get experiences on their resumes to get internships and full-time roles. And also that allows businesses to get IS services they might not have otherwise procured. So Dr. Uh, Sasidaran is a big fan of the win-win strategy. 
Uh, so his service has also resulted in a lot of positive outcomes, including improving curriculum, making it easier for students to find roles during and after their college careers, hiring engaged and effective fa faculty, granting scholarships to deserving students, and enabling success in programs by participating in AACSB and other accreditations. So it may seem impossible, um, given so much focus on his career, but Sheriff and his wife, Rita, have created a beautiful family. Nick, who is 12, is an avid YouTuber and also runs his own channel. And his daughter, uh, Niha, who's seven, loves ballet and singing. Uh, so Sheriff has established himself as an expert in many areas. And he also, he finds time to give back. I'm an example of that. I was in, um, in IS, Information Systems, for about 16 years and then decided to come over and into academics. And I met Sheriff uh, at the beginning of my PhD program and he was immediately so helpful and supportive. He's offered to um, do research with me so he can share the tools that he's built over the years um, so that I can benefit in my career um, as well. Um, he is kind, gracious, approachable, humble. He leads by example, and he's offered me academic, professional, and personal advice. Um, I'm deeply grateful that our paths have crossed and am very proud to call him a friend. Uh, his presentation today is on the psychological impact of color, um, specifically color theory in the context of human cognition and behavior. This is important to organizations because um, it persuades, it allows them to persuade customers and consumers like you and I into buying all kinds of products and services. Shara, thank you for being here and sharing your important uh, research with us. And uh, I look forward to the content. And just FYI, I'm gonna have to leave a little early. It's morning here and I teach in about an hour. <laughs> thank you so much, ma'am. Now it's time we welcome our chief guest, Dr. Sharad Sashitharan, to enlighten us through his knowledgeable words. So please. Okay, thank you, Bethany, for those nice words. I didn't quite realize how awesome I was, but thank you anyway. Uh, so as Bethany mentioned in her introduction, uh, this presentation is all about color. Our world revolves around color and we see the world through color. And color, even without our realizing it, has always been an integral part of our existence. Color plays a very important role in driving our emotions, in shaping our perceptions. And let me start off with a very simple example. Take a look at this traffic signal. All of us know, pretty much everyone in this world knows that red represents stop and green represents go. Everyone knows it. Now the big question is, how do we know that? So if you are a newborn baby, you have just come into the world and you show the baby red or green, doesn't mean anything to the baby, right? But once the baby grows and reaches say four or five years old, the baby knows very well what is meant by red and what is meant by green. So red is always stop and green is always go. But again, from a psychological perspective, how do we actually know that? Well, it's because of our social environment, our conditioning. Yeah. As babies, you know, our parents, our siblings, etc., would have pointed to the color red and said, hey, guess what? That means danger. So if you have an equipment that is malfunctioning, there might be a red light in front of it. Guess what? It's not working. It's dangerous to play around with that. Whereas if it is green, it's fine. Let's go, okay? So the meaning that we associate with red and green is more a function of our social condition. We were not born with this particular connection, red meaning stop and green being go. It's something we got from our environment. So what happens is in our mind, we have what is called a mental map or a mental schema, which attaches meanings to colors. And I just picked red and green 
and the traffic signal example, because that would be the most pervasive uh, concept of a mental map. Any creature in the universe, well, any human being in the universe, red would mean stop and green, of course, would mean go. Now, consider a situation where you are in a place where you are facing a traffic signal. All the drivers around you move their vehicles when the signal is red and they stop when the signal is green. The big question is, how do you feel, okay? Your mental map or your mental schema that is internalized in you connects stop with red and go with green. And here you have the entire world around you at least doing the opposite. Or in other words, your mental map has been challenged. And when that happens, human beings feel irritable, they feel angry, uh, they feel annoyed, they feel upset, and that's quite natural. Now, as I mentioned, humans see the world through color. Color has meanings. Red meaning stop and green meaning go is perhaps the most universal associations with red and green. And as I mentioned, it is a product of your societal environment, cultural conditioning, and to a certain extent, human psychology, sorry, physiology, and we will get to that in a minute. Which brings me to what is called the schema congruity theory. And I mentioned that a couple of seconds back. In our minds, we have a mental map or a mental schema. And if you are in a place where the external signals from your environment contradict your mental map. You end up feeling confused, upset, and irritated. And that's not a situation human beings want to find themselves in. All of us prefer to have happiness, peace, tranquility. So whenever your mental map is challenged by external signals, you can do one of two things. The first thing you can do is reevaluate your mental map and come up with a modified version of it that matches those external signals. But that's a very, very difficult thing to do. I use the term mental map, but this applies to our entire value system. What we think should happen in the world, the beliefs we have internalized in ourselves. When those get challenged by external signals, we feel uneasy, we feel irritable. Now, changing our mental map is very, very difficult. And most people don't even attempt to do it. The preferred way is to challenge those external signals as wrong and to protect our mental map. And that is the essence of what is called the schema congruity theory. Again, the actual theory is far more complex, but again, in the context of this study, this is how the schema concrete theory would pan out. Going back to the title of this presentation, uh, if you look at North America, which is the research context and where I am now, since the 1940s, the convention or the tradition has been Pink color is for girls and blue is for boys, especially little girls and little boys. Now, prior to the 1940s, uh, you had several periods of time where pink was actually for boys and uh, blue was for girls. But since the 1940s and even today, this is the mental map of most people in the United States and the surrounding countries. And how did this happen since the 1940s? Well, one of the reasons was that the 34th president of the United States, Dwight Eisenhower, during his presidential swearing in ceremony, the first lady, Mammy Eisenhower, wore a nice pink dress. And she was immediately hailed as a style icon, a fashion icon. And since that time onwards, 
this is sort of stuck and is prevalent even today. And it's, it's a very, very interesting concept. Uh, color has always fascinated me. A whole lot of my research uh, deals with color. And uh, many years back, actually, uh, 10, 12 years back, uh, I started dabbling in color research. And what I would do is I started off doing some behavioral experiments. You could call them pranks, okay? So this is my son. He's six months of age in this photo. Now, if you look at him, he could easily pass off for a girl at that age. And uh, being a boy, being a boy, you can see that surrounding him, uh, the chair, the rocking chair that he is sitting in is actually blue in color. Okay, so if you go to any store in the United States, and if you go to the girl section, especially the little girl section, it's filled with dolls in pink and so on. If you go to the boy section, it's all various shades of blue, uh, Superman and Batman and all the other stuff that boys like. Okay, so in his case, of course, we got him his uh, blue rocking chair. Of course, he's not conscious of the connotation of blue with boys. He's too small to know that. So what I would do as a behavioral experience is I would dress him up in pink. Okay, now he's too young to protest. He doesn't know what pink is or what blue is, but I would dress him up in pink. And I would take him with me when I go shopping or when we go shopping. So this is a scene from a Walmart that is very close to my campus, to my university. So you can see him sitting in here. He's all bundled up because I believe it was winter at the time uh, I actually took that photo. And what would happen is he would be dressed all in pink, okay? And this is a Walmart that is close to the university. So lots of my students would actually be working there or would be hanging around the place. So uh, what I would do is I would push them in the cart along the place. And you know, my students, especially the girls, uh, they would come over when they see the professor pushing the baby along and they would take a look at him and you know, see him in pink and it would be like, Hey, doctors, guess what? You have got such a beautiful little girl. Oh, she's so much of a cutie. She's so pretty. Okay. I would listen to all that with a straight face, with a smile. And at the end, I would look at them and say, guess what? It's a boy. It is a boy. And you know, you can see the stunned expression in their faces. Uh, they look surprised, they look shocked for the simple reason that their mental schema or their mental map has been challenged, okay? So their mental map is boys should be in blue or shades of blue and girls should be in shades of pink. And here is someone who is dressed up in pink, but the dad says it's a boy. So their mental schema or mental map has been challenged, hence the confusion in their face. So just by looking at their faces, I can sort of figure out what they are thinking. Oh my God, is it a boy? Why is it in pink? Pink is for girls. So that's their mental schema being challenged. And they have got two options there. One is change their mental schema. The other is, think that the external sig signal, my son being in pink, is a wrong signal. And most of the time we go and find fault with the external signal. So, you know, my students think, guess what? Dr. S, our professor is a nice guy, but a little bit crazy, you know, he's coming here dressed up, uh, you know, his son is dressed up in pink, okay? So I can see it in their faces. Oh my God, the professor is crazy. And uh, that's how the world actually operates. Uh, colors have meanings associated with it. We have internalized it without our knowledge. And when we are in a situation, when that internalization is challenged, we feel uneasy, 
we do not want to change our internal analyzations. So typically we shut out or find fault with the external signals. Now, this was 11, 12 years back. So this is my son today. And of course I can't dress him up in pink. Okay, he would be absolutely infuriated and he wouldn't allow me to do that. And he typically prefers to be in shades of blue. Okay, and uh, he's 12. He actually turned 12 today and he's watching. So happy birthday, Nick. Uh, but again, blue is for boys. Now, if you take my daughter, okay, if you take my daughter, she is always a vision in pink. Okay, she can't let go of pink. So that's Neha at six months. Uh, that's a more recent photo. And if you look at this carefully, you know, she's got a pink top, a pink hairband. There is some pink here in her shoes. And of course, she is posing in front of her favorite pink flowers. And this, again, is a very recent photo. Again, pink, pink, pink. It's a vision in pink. You go to her room, it's all pink in there. And nothing surprising about it. Uh, those are the signals she got from the outside world as she was growing up in the United States that pink is for girls. She internalized it, and now she is expressing it and very comfortable with it. She goes to school. All her friends, the girls, uh, would be in various shades of pink. They prefer pink. It's a pink world for them, and they are comfortable in that environment. Now, the association of uh, associating meanings to color has got a cultural aspect to it. So this pink is for girls and blue is for boys. Uh, is sort of the cultural environment here in the United States. However, that of course is not uh, there in India, okay? Uh, in fact, to be honest, uh, pink is one of my favorite colors, if not my favorite color, okay? So this is my alma mater, the College of Engineering Trivandrum. Uh, so many, many years back, I did my undergraduate degree in there. So growing up in India, I loved pink and I would wear pink shirts and I never had an issue with it, okay? So if you were to take a photo of mine from those days, this might be as it looked. Of course, I couldn't get an actual photo. So this is my head alone, passport size photo. And this of course is some other model behind it, but again, this was me in the mid 90s and pink was my favorite color. I had no problems wearing pink shirt to university, to college. And you know, my friends too would wear pink and we were all happy in pink. And that's the aspect of the cultural context. Pink is fine in an Indian context, but you know, you have uh, different perceptions in say a North American context. And interestingly, when I look at this particular photo, I see that my favorite college seems to be painted shades of pink for whatever reason. It's been a while since I've been there. So usually it's uh, cream and white, but now it's shade of pink. And I really don't know why. Maybe it's a problem with the camera, Cam but again, pink. Yes, that is correct. So I have a comment saying that the scheme of color is in the US alone. Yeah, and I agree with that. You don't have that in India, which is why there is no problem to having pink in India. So that color coordination, as I emphasized, is in the United States. You don't have it in India, right? And that's the cultural aspect of it. So in India, it's perfectly fine. And that's why I mentioned Pink is my favorite color in India and I have no problems wearing it you know, while I was going to university there or to college there. Now, another interesting anecdote. When I first came to the United States, uh, and this was a couple of decades back, uh, my cousin Bipin, uh, Bipin Prabhakar, he was at the airport to welcome me, okay? So we were going to his home in his car 
And I could see him looking at me, you know, through the side of his eyes, you know, eyeing me like this. And I'm like, what is your problem? Haven't you seen me before? No, why are you looking at me like that? And he just smiled and said, you know, what do you think you're wearing? What do you mean? What do you think I'm wearing? I'm wearing my favorite pink shirt. Well, you don't think you should be doing that here. What do you mean? I'm in the US for the first time, land of the brave. I'm here to make my life, my fortune. What should I wear other than my favorite pink shirt? So he, of course, our conversation was in Malayalam. So I will switch to Malayalam for a second. So he was like, Day, Ninda Shartaga Puti Geti and Baggy Vichon. In the Ivade, Ni pink shirt at a ganda, and then Ni Adi made him. And I'm like, hey, why is this guy saying this to me? So I asked him, what is the problem? And he is like, Nia the Tane Manaslaki Kur, Ni Mulan Yan in a pinky carnal. So that conversation stuck with me, okay? And later on, you know, after my PhD, when I got into color theory, you know, uh, I sort of gained a better understanding of that. So you have this cultural context uh, for color. And again, uh, this presentation, of course, because I'm in a North American context, I'm referring primarily to color connotations in the context of the United States. But again, color, has significance for us, it has a cultural context. So this is a very big chart and uh, it might be difficult for you to read it and I don't expect you to be able to read it anyway, but again, the whole point here is that over here you've got a whole spectrum of colors and over here what is being shown is the meaning of that color in different contexts. So the Western context, the Eastern context, and again, you have continent-wise, European, uh, Middle East, America, and country-wise, Brazil, China, India, and so on. So what this chart actually shows you is that wide range of connotations that get associated with color all over the world. And, uh, People view things, view objects, you know, of different colors and associate different meanings based on those colors, depending on the country or the culture or the continent or the area they might be living in. And this chart is just to show you the spread of uh, the different connotations of color the world over. Now, let's take uh, the color red. Red in the context of a traffic signal means, you know, stop, and that's pretty universal. And the color red is fairly universal anywhere in the world. It refers to danger, fight, flight, passion, excitement, and things like that. The other thing about the color red is it's got a physiological aspect in that when you are faced with the color red, your body generates what are called flight hormones. Red means danger. So your body is getting ready to run away from something or to fight something or someone. And which is why the body automatically generates flight hormones. So color two can result in physiological changes, hormones being generated in your body. Now, all these associations of color with human emotion, human perceptions are well known to marketing researchers and marketing professionals. So what they do is when you have a product or a brand and you want human beings to associate certain emotions with it, then they apply that particular color to whichever is a product or brand that you are selling. So red, as I've said, is the color of urgency, passion, excitement, which is why if you look at fast food chains like KFC, McDonald's and so on, and within the US other chains like Arby's and Wendy's and so on, they always have red in their buildings, in their logo. They cannot do without red. Coca-Cola of course is a 
global brand, one of the best known, and you know they have they 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 show red prominently uh, because the people behind creating these logos, the marketing professionals, know that the color red conveys a sense of passion and excitement to human beings, and you know they want that passion, that excitement, to be associated with Coca Cola. Uh, the other thing, the physiological impact of red is it tends to increase your appetite. So if you are running a fast food joint, what you want is people to get in there, feel really hungry, really fast, eat as much of the stuff as they can and get out of there. Physiologically, red is the best color for that. And knowing this, you have marketing professionals uh, that go in and associate red with uh, fast food chains and brands and so on. Similar to red, another favorite color is blue, but blue is viewed as a color of trust, of dependability, of security, okay? If you look at uh, United States and many other countries of the world, uh, law enforcement professionals, policemen, uh, actually go ahead and uh, law enforcement professionals, policemen, etc. actually go with the color blue. And uh, blue is seen as, so I'm hearing a comment, unable to read the screen. Uh, is that true for all of you or is it a one-off? So there will be a Q&A session at the end of the session. So we will move on to the comment section after that. Isn't that okay? Is it okay for you? Yeah, that's okay for me. But, okay the, comment for me, but the, comment, the comment I'm getting is that the screen is not clear and you cannot see it or read it. Uh, can sir, you see? It's, and, I think it's, uh, it's okay, sir. It's visible. You are audible and it's well. Let's see. Well seen. Screen is uh, clear. Okay. Screen is okay. Clear. Okay, thank you, because I saw a comment that stated that the screen was not clear. So screen and anyway. voice clear. Okay, thank you. So if you look at the color uh, blue, again, color of trust, security, dependability. See, I'm wearing blue. Uh, it's seen as a classic interview dress. So whenever you go to attend an interview, the advice you get is wear a shade of blue. And there is a reason for that. You know, uh, If uh, you are going before a potential employer, the employer must be able to trust you, must be able to perceive you as being uh, dependable, perceive you as being dependable. So that tends to be the classic interview dress. Blue calms the mind. Uh, tranquility, peace of mind, that's what blue does to you. And your marketing professionals do know that that's the impact that blue has on you. So most financial institutions actually use blue in their symbols, in their logos, in their marketing. So if you look over here, American Express, uh, Visa, Bank of America, uh, PayPal, all these are uh, financial institutions that go for blue for the simple reason that they know well in advance that people associate blue with trust, security, and dependability. Uh, same with technology companies. You know, when you buy a Dell computer, you want to be sure that it's reliable and blue is the color of reliability, so their logo will have shades of blue. Okay, so blue is trust, security, dependability, and so on. Uh, now, a physiological aspect of blue is it curbs appetite, okay? So, and that's very interesting. So if you're like me, always trying to keep your weight down, you know, uh, one technique might be eat food off a blue plate on a blue table in a blue room, okay? That curbs your appetite and you can be sure you would be eating less. But again, uh, back to topic, blue is the classic color of trust and security. Orange and yellow, cheer, optimism, enthusiasm. You want to live, you are hopeful, you are looking forward to the future. That's what orange and yellow uh, usually convey. 
So here is our own Maggie, okay? Maggie has got a cover of yellow for a reason, okay? They didn't put it as black. They didn't put it as white. They didn't uh, put it as green or anything. They wanted to convey a certain meaning and association to Maggie, and that's why it ends up in being in yellow. Uh, MACD, of course, uh, red is a predominant color, fast food chain, okay? And they also have got an yellow. Uh, our favorite Fanta, of course, is in orange, you know, uh, good cheer, uh, hope for the future. So that's sort of the association uh, that uh, the people behind that branding actually wanted to go in for. Another color is green. Okay, that's in the context of a traffic signal, of course, that is go, but generally it's associated with health, nature, uh, the outdoors, money, and so on and marketeers have actually adopted that. So if you look at the fruit drink Tropicana, you know, the logo is in green. Uh, TD Ameritrade, that's a stock broker. So dealing with money, green goes in well. This is actually a funny one. It's Coca-Cola Life, okay? So in recent years, there have been this move towards reducing the sugar content in fizzy drinks. So people became more health conscious. So with that in mind, uh, Coca-Cola introduced Coca-Cola Life, okay? And they introduced it in green. Now, why did they use green? Because that symbolizes health uh, for most people. Okay, uh, it symbolizes health for more people for most people. Okay, so they introduced this, but guess what? It totally bombed. You know, if you look at the mental map of people, Coca Cola has always been red, passion, excitement, being edgy. Uh, and all of a sudden he hit them with a green Coca Cola, telling them it's healthy, at least with a green cover, telling them it's healthy. No way they are going to accept it. You know, their mental schema won't, will, will just shut it out. And of course, uh, this was a big bust and it didn't last at all. So of course they had Coca-Cola Zero, right? And they went back to the familiar uh, red color and people were happy. And of course, Diet Coke and uh, Coke Zero Air, big hits here in the United States and the world over. Again, this goes back to how human beings perceive color, the previous mental map we have, the external signals we get. If those external signals match with our mental map, we are happy to have it. So we are happy to drink Coke from this can, but it would be difficult for us to drink it from a green can. Okay. So that is the aspect of color influencing us, influencing our emotions. The other aspect that I've researched has to do with fonts, okay? Uh, gone are the days when we actually write stuff with pen uh, on a piece of paper, okay? All of us are using uh, uh, documents now, digital documents now, so fonts become important. Just as human beings associate certain meanings to color, they also associate certain meanings to fonts, okay? Uh, this has not been heavily researched and it has not been heavily applied in marketing, but uh, uh, this uh, literature is actually out there. And you know, there have been several studies in this area. And what research shows is that people uh, perceive what are called serif fonts. I'm not getting into the technical details of serif, but serif uh, typically family of fonts and the most prominent font there is the Times New Roman. And uh, this is one of the most commonly used fonts in formal legal documents, the Times New Roman. And it belongs to a family of fonts called the serif fonts. These fonts are perceived by humans to be traditional, stable, mature, practical, trustworthy. And it's the equivalent of blue 
if you look at colors. So if you look at colors, the color blue conveys tradition, stability, maturity, and trustworthiness. The equivalent in the font world is Times New Roman. Same way, another font that we use very commonly is what is called the sans serif font family. The most common font in there is your Arial font. Now, what I have shown is not Arial, but Verdana, which is close to Arial. And these fonts are perceived to be elegant, contemporary, and classy. Then you have the monospace font family. And the one I have shown in here is the courier font, okay? Now, the courier font is the most hated font in the world. No one likes it. It's viewed as plain, cold, unimaginative, and unappealing. And then you have another font family called script. So that's when you write in what you call cursive writing or something close to that. And what I have shown here is the Christian font, which is part of the script family. And this one is perceived to be casual, youthful, rebellious, and exciting, passionate. Uh, so just as, just as colors have meanings associated with it, fonts too will have meanings associated with it. And uh, there have been one major research study conducted on fonts. And this was actually conducted by Lexmark, uh, which is a printer company. And what they actually did was, uh, this study was conducted in Britain and they had people and their people were exposed to several different fonts. And they were also given a list of prominent personalities in the UK, in Britain. And what they were asked to do is, Take a look at a font, match it to a prominent individual or one of those prominent individuals in the list. So a vast majority of people match the Siri font, and this is a font family, the actual font is Times New Roman, with Anna Ford, who she's retired now, but she used to be a very reputed journalist and television presenter in Britain. And she worked for the BBC and other uh, channels. So when Anna Ford comes to the TV and says something, people believe her. And that's why they associated the Times New Roman font with Anna Ford. And then you have the monospace font. And what the respondents in that particular study did was, they associated the monospace font with a character named Ian Beal uh, of EastEnders. So EastEnders is a soap opera that uh, has been running for quite a while in Britain. I don't know if it is there uh, currently. At the time I was in Britain, uh, EastEnders, I used to watch it occasionally. And Ian Beale is a character in that. And no one liked him. No one liked him. You, you could call him the villain. He's not really the villain of that particular serial, but you know, no one really liked him. It's a character viewers love to hate. And so the respondents of this research study, when they saw the monospace font, and this is the courier font, monospace is the name of the font family, so the specific font is courier, they associated that with Ian Beale because they felt this font is a hated font, they don't like it, they feel unhappy when they see it. So that was the association of courier. The other font was sans serif, and that's, uh, generally your aerial font. Here I have shown it as a Verdana font, but it's viewed as to be elegant, contemporary, classy. And the personality that was associated with the Verdana font was Richard Branson, who is a business magnate, investor, and philanthropist in Britain. Uh, and of course, he is the owner of the Virgin Group. Uh, so pretty much, So 
So Serif font indicates, you know, trust, dependability, honesty, straightforwardness, and all that. Okay, just in response to that chat comment that came up. Uh, but again, sans serif is elegant, contemporary, classy, stylish. Now, that's the research that is out there, okay? My area of work is specifically human-computer interaction. So I look at how human beings interact with computers and systems. And what I was interested in was, you know, there's a lot of research on color, some research on font, but very few research studies that have actually put them together. So that was what I was trying to do. So this was what I had in mind. Suppose you have a product and you're trying to sell that product online through a website. So when you design the website, the website will have a predominant uh, design color. It will also have a font associated with it. Now, as human beings, we attach certain associations or emotions to color as well as to font. So when we are uh, thinking about buying a product from a website, if the color of the website and the font of the website sings or is a match with your mental map of all the your preferred requirements with that product, then you would tend to buy that product. That was my argument. That was my hypothesis. And okay. that's the part I wanted to explore. So pretty much you're selling a product through a website. If your product requirements match your perceptions of the meaning of the color and font used by the website, you will tend to purchase the product. Okay, that's an application of the schema congruity theory. You have a mental map with certain emotions and associations given to certain colors. The same with fonts. You are in a website, you want to purchase a product from there. If the color, the dominant color used to design the website and the font that is used in that website sings or is a match with your preferred requirements of the product, then you are more likely to purchase the product. So that was my hypothesis. There were actually four or five of them, but in a nutshell, that's the hypothesis that uh, we go in for. So research design. Uh, again, I'm not betting in any of the technical aspects, uh, but I used what is called a two by two by two factorial design. And I will quickly show that uh, using some images. So basically what I did was I created two categories of websites. The first website uh, deals with selling financial products, bank loans, mortgages, and the like. Uh, the second design deals with products for the outdoors, say camping equipment, hiking equipment, uh, skis, uh, hiking boots, and the like. So I created two different websites, one selling financial products, the other selling outdoor services. For each of these categories, I had for each of these categories, I had two dominant design colors. So uh, for the financial services website, I would have two versions of it, one in blue, the other in green. And this is of course the dominant background color. So one would be in blue, the other would be in green. For the outdoor services, again, I would have a blue version and a green version in there. And then I went ahead and for the financial services with blue as the dominant color, I came up with two different versions. One in which the text is using the Times New Roman font, the other in which the text is written in the Christian font. So in short, 
these were the different categories of web pages that I had. So financial services, color blue, font, Times New Roman. Financial services, prominent color being green, using the Christian font, and so on and so forth. And what my hypothesis is, suppose you want to purchase financial services, which website would you prefer the most? Well, the idea is, if you're dealing with the financial aspect of things, you know, you want trust, you want dependability, you want honesty in transactions. And in your mental map, the color for that is blue. And Times New Roman, of course, is the font that conveys uh, all the things that blue conveys, you know, trust, honesty, dependability. So for selling a financial services product, if you have a website with the dominant design color being blue and the font being times, it is highly likely that you will trust this website the most and purchase the product. Same way, if you are looking at outdoor services, you are looking at the great outdoors, right? Hiking, camping, nature. So in your mental map, the most appropriate color would be green. And again, you are speaking of the outdoors, okay? About passion, being free birds, the corresponding color would belong to the, sorry, the corresponding font would be the Christian font, which belongs to the script family. So this is a font that is usually associated with excitement, outdoors, being a free bird and so on. Or in other words, if I were to buy camping equipment, then this particular website with green as the dominant color and Christian as the font would be my website of choice. And all the others, of course, would come somewhere in between that. Uh, so, of course, the next step, of course, is you recruit participants for your study and you allot them to each of these websites, ask them to go through it. And finally, you give them a questionnaire which measures the extent of trust in that particular website. And trust is a very powerful indicator of whether you plan to purchase from there or not. So this is essentially my research design and research propositions. And I actually conducted the experiment and again, pretty much everything fell into place when the results of the study were analyzed. And in this case, trust or your propensity to purchase is measured on a scale of zero to seven. So this 5.82 is certainly a very high number. And over here also you have a very high number 5.12. So what that essentially told me was, if you are planning to purchase financial related products, your customer or you are most likely to uh, purchase it if the background color is blue and the font used in times. And if it's outdoor services, again, this is where you have that synchronization or that matching with your mental map. And again, uh, this is in a North American context. So this may not be ap applicable all over the world, but certainly in North America. So these were the results of the study and you know, that sort of validated my hypothesis and research propositions. And uh, this came out as a publication and you know, these are more the technical details. I'm not getting into it. Uh, but essentially the high you see here was the financial services website with blue color and times font, uh, followed by the outdoor services website with green color and Christian font that had the highest level of trust in it. But let, let's leave those technical details aside. But in short, when you have a website selling your product, your customer is most likely to purchase that product if in the design of the interface, the web page say, uh, the color that is used and the font that is being used syncs with your perceptions of your requirements in that particular product. 
uh, what is its relevance today? So we are living in a COVID period and you know, lots of businesses have gone online, especially smaller companies, startups, et cetera. And lots of people are actually selling stuff on the web. And very often I come across websites and web pages where this sink or this match of the design of the web page with the mental map of the consumer or the customer is just not there. And that reduces the chance of your actually ending up purchasing from that particular website, okay? And it's actually interesting. In my previous university, I used to work with a lot of small companies in the area. And I will just share one experience. So in the street by the side of the university, there was this lady who started a coffee shop. Now this university is in a campus town. So a campus town here means that the university is the entire life of that town. You take out the university, there is nothing left. So this was in a typical campus town and this lady started a coffee shop. So she had retired and you know her savings, she actually uh, put in the coffee shop. And guess what? No one turned up there. She had uh, arranged it very nicely. It was painted in a rich coffee brown. Her website was all brown, but no one was coming in. Well, let me correct that. You know, the, uh, she would get a few elderly folks come in the morning, order a cup of coffee, hang around for five hours, waste her time, and they would walk out. So she was not making any real money with the coffee shop. So she approached the uh, College of Business there and uh, because I was dealing with some stuff, I sort of took up her case. So along with the marketing professor, I actually went to the coffee shop and took a look. And I am telling you, look, uh, Pamela, you have set up your coffee shop wonderfully, but guess what? These are young kids. Do you think they would really drink coffee? They would rather go and have uh, beer from the nearby pub. You know, they're not going to come into your coffee shop. So she was like, okay, but I thought I did this so nicely. I thought I would get all the young folks in town coming in. Well, obviously they prefer beer to your coffee. So she was like, shall I uh, start selling beer then? And we were like, oh no, you can still sell coffee. But what we will do is we will change the decor of your place, the color, the setting, also the design of your website to make coffee look like beer. That was our promise to her. So we got to work and you know, beer has got certain associations with it that make it attractive to young folks in their twenties. And we use that same color scheme decor to bring the coffee shop perceptually to what attracts young people to beer. And that's the way we actually perceived it. And guess what? In a couple of months, her customer base increased by 30 to 50%. And since that, we did it for some uh, other small businesses. And anywhere from 20 to 50%, there was an increase in clientele. And uh, that was a really big success. Uh, so, I'm running out of time. So to conclude, so this particular research of mine was interesting uh, and it you know, made it to the press. So the local press uh, came there and interviewed me about my study and so on. So I gave them the results of my experiment and hey, this is what I did and this is what I found. The next day, the local paper has got a big manner Dr. S says, blue is best. And I'm like, no, I never said that. What I said was, you know, blue has some emotions associated with it when you're selling your product. Uh, and if that product, one of the requirements is honesty and trustworthiness in your interaction with that product or service, then use blue. That's what I said. But, you know, reporters being reporters, this was what got blasted in the newspapers. And that was a real lesson for me. After that, I never talked to reporters. So if I do a research study and get some interesting results, I always keep it to myself. But again, 
this was a very interesting study, something that I'm passionate in. And again, uh, the comments that I'm getting uh, pretty much, I think an earlier comment was very significant. Everything is about the mind. Everything is about the perception. Everything is about psychology. So thank you all for your time. And uh, I guess I've gone over by one minute, but that is fine. So please, uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask them. I'm seeing some comments, but I guess the questions would be read out to me, I believe. Yes, sir. Thank you so okay. much, sir. That was truly a wonderful session. We okay. got to understand a lot, lot from you uh, through your presentation. Uh, we do have some questions in the chat section. May I move on to the Q&A session? Yep, please. Okay, sir. Uh, the first question is, why is Apple white? <laughs> now, white has got certain meanings associated with it, and I've not uh, really touched upon white in this study, uh, but white is, uh, after blue, white is the color of dependability, okay, of trustworthiness, of reliability, okay? So, uh, white and blue are used interchangeably. Okay, the red, of course, that's the color of apple itself. Okay, so uh, while I say that blue is the color that is most appropriate uh, for conveying honesty and trustworthiness, it's not the only color. Okay, there are other colors that do the same, but maybe not to the extent of blue. Uh, okay, sir. The next question is from Dr. S. Benikobar, sir. Uh, Google logo and Windows logo has four colors. What do they represent? Uh, I don't really know, but I, I can take a guess. Uh, whenever you have an array of colors, it means diversity, inclusivity, okay? And uh, the current cultural movement, uh, especially in North America and Europe, is towards embracing diversity, being inclusive of everyone involved. Uh, so if you look at aspects like, you know, transgender and so on, you have different colors of a rainbow representing each uh, one of us having different characteristics and features. So usually when you have a spectrum of colors, that sort of tends to show diversity and inclusivity. Okay, so the next question, why is there so much importance for colors in life and business? How, how is it a marketing strategy? Well, internal to us, we always associate or we attribute certain meanings to color. And that's internalized. That's in us. We are not consciously thinking about it. As I said, blue is the color of dependability. White too is the color of dependability. So if I'm conducting a job interview and I'm interviewing people, assume I have five candidates. One of them comes in a blood red shirt or dress, another one in a blue one, another one in a white one, another one in a black one, and another one in a purple one. Who am I likely to recruit? All else remaining the same, most likely the blue or the white, and perhaps the red. Uh, but blue would be the most likely one. And that's just what we are as human beings. Those are signals that we pick up from the surroundings. That's our mental map and that's just not going to change. So whether it be in life or in business, if you can come up with color schemas that sort of match or sync with our internalizations of color that helps us in selling our product better. Okay, sir. Uh, so the next question, the orange background matches your pleasant style of presentation. In the new world where gender geographic stereotypes are broken, do you think these colors, a connotation, will still be relevant? Very good question. And I was expecting that. As to the color of my background, well, orange happens to be the color of my university. Okay, so you can see the logo in here, it's in orange. So, uh, my dean is not watching this presentation, it's, uh, but if he were watching, he might expect me to wear an orange top to show my allegiance to BGSU. Uh, 
Uh, but again, that's a whole different thing. I didn't wear orange because that would be too much of orange around the place. But again, back to the topic, society is changing, okay? And as society changes, would such stereotypes be there? Well, uh, society is always in transition. So even if you look at the pink is for girls and blue is for boys, that was there since the 1940s. Now, if you look at the period prior to the 1940s, there were decades or centuries where uh, pink was the preferred color for boys and blue the preferred color for girls. So it's society in transition. And as we move along, mental schemas and mental maps will keep on changing. Uh, and as a society, as we are moving forward, stereotypes are being broken down uh, and things are changing. Uh, at this point in time, uh, most of these uh, color associations hold good. 100 years, 200 years from today, they might very well be different. Such a society, we are constantly changing and evolving. Okay, so the next question is again from Dr. Asbenikopar, sir. Uh, National Geography logo is yellow in color. What could be the logical and rational reason behind it? Uh, could you repeat that first sentence? National Geography logo is yellow in color. Oh, yes. National Geographic. Yes. Yellow is the color of happiness, okay? Uh, enjoyment, uh, hope for the future. Uh, now, typically it... Uh, Green might have very well been a better color. So if you look at organizations like Greenpeace and so on, they do have green, uh, but National Geographic went with yellow. But again, that is hope for the future and so on. Uh, the other aspect that I didn't touch upon is, uh, so my entire proposition, my entire argument is when the outside world matches our mental map, we are happy and we tend to purchase or interact more with that person entity object. Now, the reverse can also hold true. If you see an external signal that contradicts your mental map, you might feel irritable, but that might make you think, okay? Why is this so different from my mental map? And sometimes people start thinking, and in the process of thinking, they end up forming a connection with that product. So the opposite too can happen. Uh, but again, uh, I don't have a very good answer why National Geographic went with uh, yellow, but at least they didn't go with red. Uh, I would have preferred to see in green, but yellow is good enough, I guess. It's happiness, joy, hope for the future. Why people choose blue for boys and pink for girls and not any other color? As I said, uh, this is something that has evolved over the years. So prior to the 1940s, uh, there were periods in history when the opposite was true. Uh, blue was for girls and uh, pink was for boys. So in the period we are living in, such is the case. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, you know, in 1953, when Dwight Eisenhower was sworn in as the 34th president of the United States, his wife, the first lady at that time, Mami Eisenhower was dressed in a beautiful pink dress. Okay, so in the United States, presidential inaugurations and the first lady are held in very high regard. And when uh, Mrs. Eisenhower, the first lady came dressed in this beautiful pink dress, the press uh, went gaga over it. It was so beautiful, uh, she's so stylish. And after that, what happened was you have marketing professional pushing pink as the color for girls. So this is actually to a considerable extent also driven by marketing. So that is the place we are in, but as someone else mentioned, uh, stereotypes are being broken and this may not be the case 50, 100 years into the future. But in North America at this point in time, this is generally the case. And it just uh, was an evolution over time. Uh, so the next question is from Dr. Anand Banke, sir. Uh, seven colors in spectrum, seven ragas in music, seven chakras in yoga correspond to each other in intuition. Any comments on this? Uh, if you are looking at it purely from a psychological perspective, uh, uh, you are looking at diversity. 
from a social purpose uh, perspective, we are looking at inclusivity. Uh, but again, uh, I'm not too much into music anyway. So, uh, and I believe there is some math formulas also involved in those musical notes and so on. But again, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I don't have additional insight into that, especially the music part. Thank you, sir. Uh, so the next question, green leaves turn yellow and fall down. Yellow represents impending death. Uh, is it right? What do you have to say about that? <laughs> well, uh, these are very interesting questions. You know, I've made this presentation before academic audiences and all they challenge me on are, hey, is the strength of that relationship strong enough? Is the p-value strong enough? There is something wrong with your design. So. Uh, this is actually a refreshing change, these questions. So over here, you have the green leaves and this photo was taken uh, in the time we were moving into fall. So you can see some yellow leaves there and then they died and fell down. Uh, does that mean, does it have any significance with psychology? Uh, honestly, I don't know. Uh, it's just the play of nature. It just happens. Uh, but again, come spring, you know, you get those pale green leaves come again. So uh, apart from it being the natural cycle of nature, I don't see much uh, significance in it, at least from a business perspective. And I'm a business professor at the end of it all. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, the next question is from Harry Dilal, sir. What is the anecdote for identifying blue to boys? And uh, there is... Uh, the pink association came with Mamie Eisenhower. Uh, the blue, uh, there is no specific reason. It just sort of evolved over time. And if you look at it, you, marketing professionals push blue onto boys. And so if you go to one of these toy stores here, uh, in the little girl section, you will get all this stuff in pink and mainly dolls. And if you look at the boy section, you have Superman dressed in blue. And uh, I, 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 uh, I couldn't identify anything that specifically pushed blue onto boys, but again, it's more done by the marketing professionals over time. Okay, so, so that was the last question. Uh, hence, we'll come to the end of the Q&A session. Thank you so much, sir, for all those words of wisdom. Uh, now, let me welcome A. Suhai sir from Lakamalui Foundation Trust to Landrum to propose a word of thanks. So please. Good evening, everybody. It's now my pleasant duty to propose the word of thanks. We just had the 45th talk of the <clears throat> popular weekly webinar series by Professor Sharath Shashidharan. It was a brilliant talk. The topic of today's talk is uh, very fascinating and arousing a lot of curiosity, like a mysterious Valentine message. Blue is for boys, pink is for girls, leveraging color and emotion in digital marketing. We are all living in a very colorful world, but still we are ignorant about the meaning and value of colors. Professor Sharath has revealed many secrets about colors, and he planted inside us a deeper insight into the world of colors and connected with the business applications and in our civil life. It was really amazing to know the impact of colors on our psyche and emotions and how to make this an advantage in our business dealings. So it was a truly insightful talk of great practical value. We never knew that colors have so much impact in our life and how to make use of these values to make more profitable, more meaningful, more interesting, more refreshing life. Colors have always been a fascination for all of us. Different colors in the nature has, has really induced us and uh, have been very happy with 
the colors around us, enjoying the colors around us in flowers, in the sky, in the blue lake. So much of colors on that. And these colors have really deeper meaning. Professor is, uh, was wearing a blue shirt. Without knowing, I am wearing a pink shirt. So I, I now understand that pink is for girls and not for boys or, or men. But in India, we do, we do not know the difference. So we, we don't pay much attention to the difference in colors. Anyhow, it has been a very exciting talk and how to win the business with the right appropriate colors. It was a great knowledge shared, shared with us, sir. And you have presented in a very amazing, very light, as a excellent teacher, taking the his students through a very enjoyable trip of colors and business and all that. So we have been immensely benefited. We would like to thank uh, you for your uh, valuable time you spent on this. And we present to you a memento on the token of appreciation from all the partnering organizations. And, uh, thank you, sir, for your kind words. And uh, thank you, Harindralal, sir, for uh, giving me the opportunity to uh, make this presentation. And uh, thank you, Pagya and Nesma, for your wonderful anchoring. And thank you all for your time. And have a great rest of your day. Sorry, rest of your night. So thank you all. And uh, I'll be signing off for now. Thank you. Vijay Harindralal has been doing a wonderful job picking the best of speakers and creating a global platform for people to assemble together on every Wednesday evening. And yes, to, yeah. yeah, so and, we, and that's very true. So let's give a round of applause to Harindra Lal, sir, too. And the seven partnering organizations have been taking keen interest to sustain this uh, program. IEEE Institute of Engineers, INSOC, uh, Project Management Institute, EMBS, Okamale Foundation Trust. So all of these, all these organizations deserve a big applause. And without the participation of the uh, eminent uh, attendees of this program, this would not have sustained. So we have people participating from different parts of the globe, from America, from Malaysia, Singapore, so many countries. And this is, this is broadcast through the YouTube also. It is reaching a lot of people. So, we are very thankful to all the partnering organizations for their uh, enthusiasm in conducting this program systematically without fail. In the last 45, 45 weeks, we had continuously this program. And uh, the role players, uh, Nesma Bhagisri Bethani, was giving a very good introduction about the professor. So, brilliant job. We thank you all once again for being with us. Looking forward to see you again next week. Thank you very much. Thank you all and uh, bye. Signing off. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Once again, I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to our honorable chief guest for taking a precious time out of this busy schedule to be with us today and sharing all your valuable ideas and thoughts on this very important topic. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Um, bye. Now, I would like to inform all of you about our fourth sixth talk, Physiotherapy, Key to Pain-Free Life by Sri M. Mambudri, Director and Chief Physiotherapist at Executive Center for Physiotherapy, which is to be conducted on next Wednesday, 24th of February from 6 to 7 p.m. Hope to see you all next Wednesday. Thus, we have come to the end of today's session. I hope you all have enjoyed the session. Now, uh, th I thank you all. Meeting is now officially dispersed. Okay, Ms. Ma, you can close the session.
sir as the head sir as the host he will be the only one who's who's able to terminate the meeting you get pardon so hey sir as he is the host he will he has the ability to terminate the